as you treat and care for your patients, we want to ensure that you do not become a patient as well. Um, a warm welcome to you from the National Health Laboratory Services uh, and the National Institute for Occupational Health. My name is Tanusha Singh, and I'm leading the uh, NIOH Outbreak Response uh, Team for COVID-19. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I'm taking it to the first slide. Just to give you a little bit of background about the institutes. Um, the National Institute for um, the National Institute, um, which is trying to get um, the slide up. Okay. While the slide is coming up, the, the National Health Laboratory Service or NHLS provides a diagnostic service to 80% 80, 80 of the South African population. And the National Institute for Occupational Health is complementary to the National Institute uh, for Communicable Diseases. Um, and we uh, essentially provide an occupational health service to uh, both the formal and uh, informal economy and to ensure that um, workplaces remain healthy, safe and sustainable. The NRH has put together a series of training uh, sessions for different occupational groups uh, working towards preparedness for the COVID outbreak. And today our focus is going to be on health workers and um, um, the program director will indicate what the sessions are going to be for today. Um, we, during the presentations, you will be muted. So um, we, uh, please, we are asking that you send your questions through on the chat. There's a little bubble where uh, some of you have indicated yes, if you can send your questions through that. Also, we are asking for you to please register uh, by putting in your name and your email address so that we have an indication of who is online. With that, I'd like to hand over to uh, our program director, Mr. Ashraf uh, Rekliff, and he will uh, take you through the session. Thank you very much, Tanusha. I'm Ashra Freikruf, the National Training Manager, Occupational Safety Training Manager at the NIOH, um, and your um, facilitator for this particular session. So our program today, focusing particularly on healthcare workers, looking at the essential sector that is going to be the cornerstone or the linchpin around which our response as a nation is going to rely to ensure that we deal with the COVID-19 virus and the national disaster that has been declared. So you are an essential audience for us to ensure that in your workplaces and in combination and in partnership with the leadership and management of the National Department of Health and the different provincial departments of health, that you are going to be super workplace ready in order to ensure that we can deal with this to ensure that you as frontline workers will certainly be prepared and strengthened to deal with. Our program for today is uh, looking again at the latest update on the COVID-19. What is it? Where are we at this point in time? And that together with the COVID-19 workplace preparedness and prevention we dealt with my colleague, Dr. Odette Valming of the Occupational Medic Medicine section of the NIH, that's the National Institute for Occupational Health, NIH. Um, thereafter, our, um, my second colleague was Anika Matuka from the immuno Immunology and Microbiology section will be dealing with the question of the important cleaning procedures required by us in our particular um, workplaces in the healthcare uh, um, service sector. Um, thereafter, we were going to deal with the question again of foot testing and donning. Unfortunately, the gentleman that we rely on to assist us with this is not available today due to other work pressures. We do, however, uh, are working on securing a video resource for you. And therefore, at this point in time, I'm gonna ask everybody who's online to go down to the chat bubble. It's in the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. And when you click the chat, Please include your email address for us because at this point in time, Zoom is not making your contact details available to us. If you supply your email address, we can then contact you through that and supply you 
with the video resource around donning and doffing as soon as that is available. Um, thereafter, we will have the two major presentations and then have question answer session. Now be reminded that the Zoom platform is aligning in that very same chat bubble at the bottom of your bar. If you click on that, you can then type your questions because for large numbers of Zoom audiences and video link audiences, we cannot allow all of your microphones to go on, it would just be unmanageable. So please type your questions in that bubble section. At this point, I have the pleasure of inviting my colleague, Dr. Odette Volming, um, who's managed many of these sessions dealing with the latest update on COVID-19. What is it and where are we as well as COVID-19 workplace preparedness and prevention coming from the National Institute for Occupational Health? Welcome again. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, in this busy time to just to log in and to listen to the presentations. We really appreciate that. And um, all the efforts that you guys on the front line are making in terms of preparing workplaces, particularly healthcare facilities and healthcare work for, workforce um, to be ready to tackle the coronavirus. So this is a rapidly changing area, you know, it's been three months, three, technically three months, since we've been learning about, about uh, COVID-19. And so things are constantly changing, things are constantly being updated as we learn more. And so um, please, there are, there are websites where you need to constantly check to be informed, the NIH website, the NICD website, the WHO website, even the CDC website are good resources uh, to have in your back pocket um, as we tackle the implications in workplaces of this virus. So by way of background, it seems to have culminated uh, around about the 31st of December, 2019 with WHO China in uh, China branch found a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan. By the 7th of January, the causative pathogen was identified as a new coronavirus, which they now call SARS coronavirus 2. By the 30th of January, the WHO had declared a public health emergency of international concern. And um, it finally hit us on the 5th of March 2020 when South Africa had the first case of COVID-19 and this was confirmed. Uh, by the 11th of March 2020, the WHO had declared a pandemic and um, on a Sunday night, the 16th of March, our president addressed the nation and declared it a state of disaster. Uh, and put certain mechanisms in place. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. And globally, there's about 153,517 confirmed cases and uh, more than 5,000 deaths from the coronavirus. And it is, it is affected far and wide. So in terms of um, the cases that we've, we've had, we now have 62 confirmed cases with travel as well as local transmission. Just to, to set the tone and to talk a little bit about the coronavirus. The coronaviruses are enveloped single strand positive um, RNA viruses that are kind of enclosed in a, a glycoprotein layer that sort of resembles crowns or halos, and hence the name coronavirus. But these viruses have been around for many centuries and are, are often responsible for the common cold or self-limiting self upper respiratory tract infection. However, there have been previous times where there has been an outbreak where the, a coronavirus has mutated um, and uh, caused, caused disease in, in, in a population like in 2002, 2003, we had the global outbreak of SARS, um, which affected 37 countries and accounted for 774 deaths and 
more than 8,000 uh, confirmed cases. And then later on in 2012, again, we had uh, a coronavirus called the MERS coronavirus, which often, which sort of um, occurred around the middle, middle Eastern region and had been detected in 17 other countries and was, uh, had accounted for 850 deaths. And it often, these cases, while well, the SARS and the MERS were, uh, as, as they did the research, found that these viruses were transmitted in animals, but there was a cross con um, uh, transmission where it then went to humans and, and the human immunity didn't have, well, we didn't have the immunity for this and this then caused uh, a global outbreak. And in, within, with SARS, it seemed to be the bat was the, the uh, responsible um, uh, animal vector, but in the, in the MERS, it seemed to have been the camel. Currently, we haven't sort of identified the animal vector initially that caused the, our current COVID disease. So in terms of the incubation period, the mean incubation period they state as 5.2 days, but the 95 percentile um, of distribution is at 12.5 days. Hence, we allow for the 14 days of isolation or quarantine that is suggested. The basic reproductive number of this virus is estimated to be 2.28, uh, which means that one infectious case gives rise to just over two other infectious cases. It is, even though we don't have too much information about this, it's generally considered that we are not very infectious during the incubation period, um, but most of the infections that occur, with, people are most infectious when they're coughing and sneezing and symptomatic. So how is this SARS uh, coronavirus 2 transmitted? The virus, like all other viruses, needs to attach to a cell and uh, it attaches to a specific protein and then is able to enter the cell and cause disease. The site of this, the specific receptor is the angiotensin converting enzyme um, that is located sort of in the upper respiratory tract. Um, and so the, the particles or the droplets, you know, as uh, if you can see the, the picture on, um, on the right hand side of the respiratory tract, normally particles that are bigger can manage to go into the upper respiratory tract and the smaller particles manage to go all the way down to the lower respiratory tract. With the SARS coronavirus 2, virus, uh, if it's in bigger particles, it can still come through and attach at the upper respiratory level. So the particle size, big and small particles, can transmit this disease. So how does it spread? Well, oftentimes it's droplet spread. So it's respiratory droplets often that are coughed or sneezed, sort of infiltrate into the air to a distance of one to two meters and um, can also fall onto surfaces even beyond that, uh, that radius. And people who are breathing in that, in that airspace or touching uh, contaminated sur surfaces can then be infected with the coronavirus. So this is just graphically represents the danger zone for, for breathing in, but even further for, for particles that are settling down. So it's transmitted by direct contact, either touching an ill person or touching a contaminated surface or in a droplet transmission by inhaling the droplet. Now, with regards to this virus, it has a fragile outer membrane that is um, less stable in the environment and can be killed by simple disinfectants. We're going to go, uh, there's going to, uh, my colleague Olika is going to speak a little bit later about 
the disinfectants that can be used and how they should be used. So that will be covered a little bit later. There's no evidence to date in terms of how long this virus can survive in water or sewage. Um, and it is not certain how long also it can survive on, on surfaces. There have been studies that have been done, but, um, and these have shown variable results. Some say um, from 12 hours till about six days. So the survival time in the environment depends on the pH of the environment, how much concentration the inoculum size um, of the virus, the dryness, the temperature, the exposure to disinfectants, and the type of surface on which it settles. Common disinfectants such as 70% ethanol and bleach can kill the virus. So in terms of the case definition, currently cases or uh, suspected cases would present with an acute respiratory illness of sudden onset with one or more of the following. Firstly, a cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, or fever. And on top of these symptoms, also within 14 days prior to the onset of these symptoms, were in close contact with a confirmed or probable uh, COVID infection. They would also have these symptoms and uh, possibly have a, a travel history of going to a place where there's community acquired um, uh, coronavirus, or they would have worked in a healthcare facility where they were treated, uh, they were treating a patient who was infected, or in the case of a severe pneumonia of unknown etiology. That is when these patients who present in this nature are patients um, under investigation of patients with suspected COVID infection. So in terms of signs and symptoms, 80% um, of mild to moderate disease, a common flu-like illness, we spoke about the symptoms prior. Uh, on top of those symptoms that we already mentioned, people can also have shortness of breath, severe respiratory distress, as well as a headache. 15 of these, these cases would require a hospital admission. And from, this, from the cases that we've seen, about five cases become really critically ill, requiring prolonged ICU admission. And uh, of these cases, 2% is a 2% mortality rate. Persons with underlying comorbid dis disease also feel a lot worse, and those are pulmonary diseases in the elderly. Uh, they often have poorer outcomes. So how is COVID-19 diagnosed? Currently, we spoke about persons under investigation, and those are the people who fulfill the case definition. Um, so if there is under your care somebody who as, as a person of under investigation. These cases initially were all discussed with NICD. However, now with the increasing number of cases, the healthcare practitioner needs to ensure that the person under investigation fulfills the criteria that we spoke about before in terms of the case definition. And then these people, these patients need to be tested. But for any additional clinical um, guide, guidance, there is a toll-free number that can be called, as well as the NICD website gives lots of technical information with regards to investigations and treat, treatment for these patients. Okay, so the main stages of, um, of um, managing these patients is after testing, if testing is indicated rather, their patients need to be isolated. Um, specimens need to be collected in order to confirm uh, presence of the virus. And then contact tracing needs to be done. So in terms of how to do contact tracing and the monitoring of contacts, this slide is taken from the NICD website and basically is managed 
by NNCD. So once there is confirmation of infection, provincial CDCs uh, needs to identify the close contacts and they, there's a form that needs to be filled out. This is also available on the um, NICD website of all the contacts needs to be listed. And every contact uh, needs to uh, complete uh, a monitoring form that is also on the, the NICD website. These contacts will be self-quarantined for 14 days after exposure, their temperature will be checked daily and they will be looked at for signs and symptoms. This process is managed by the NICD. Okay, so just a little bit more about contact tracing. Who is a contact? A contact is any person who has had close contact, and then they say within a household or even within a workplace, with a confirmed case, while the person or the, the case was ill, or even seven days prior to them becoming symptomatic. And these include face-to-face -face contacts in a close environment. Uh, these also include uh, if a healthcare provider was taking care of a patient with a, con a confirmed case, and this healthcare provider was not wearing the recommended PPE. This is also a contact um, that needs to be isolated. Also in an airplane setting, if there's a confirmed case, anyone who is seated uh, within two seats, forward, backwards to the sides of the confirmed case, is a contact. Okay. So these close contacts need to be monitored. And the advice to them is they need to be, they need to self-quarantine at home for 14 days after exposure and do the temperature checks daily as well as look for symptoms. Um, they need to remain at home and uh, they need to avoid any unnecessary social contact or travel and they also need to be reachable for the community workers or the, um, the colleagues at the NICD who will be calling them to check for their temperature readings and to check on symptoms. Okay. So just talking a little bit, we said that contacts need to be self-quarantined, but what is quarantine? It's basically, it's separating symptomatic people who are exposed to the disease from non-exposed people. Um, compared to isolation, which separates uh, sick, uh, sick people from people who have the disease. So the quarantine procedures is a tool uh, that has been used to limit or to slow down uh, the introduction of this pathogen into our population. And it may take place at home or in a designated facility as we've seen um, internationally. Now, depending on the level of risk and the intensity of the exposure, different le levels of quarantine will be employed. Like if a person is expatriated, expatriated from China, voluntary, voluntary uh, quarantine is now being done at a facility. Um, and household members with a confirmed case are also asked to stay in their home for 14 days. Now it's also interesting that the advice is that if a healthcare worker wearing appropriate PPE is exposed, so if they were wearing appropriate PPE and is, are exposed to a confirmed case, the healthcare worker would be allowed to work, but would be requested to self-quarantine on developing symptoms for 14 days. Okay, in terms of treatment for COVID-19, currently there's no specific treatment, um, but it's more supportive treatment and monitoring. So oxygen, um, treatment with fluids, empirical anti, um, antibiotics, uh, and they suggest not giving routine corticosteroids. And these patients are closely monitored 
uh, they, all their comorbid conditions are treated as well. Communication is very important with them and family members to reduce anxiety. And as we said, contact tracing is important. There have been suggestions of treating with antiretroviral treatment, but full details of clinical management of patients is available on the WHO website, as well as the NICD guideline documents. Okay, with regards to vaccine, um, unfortunately we still have no vaccines for COVID-19. However, we have been advised to take the flu vaccine so that we decrease the amount of influenza cases that come up so that there's no unnecessary testing for COVID-19, just because they present so similarly. Okay, so now that's a little bit about the disease, but just thinking about our workers that we are looking after and who is at risk of infection. Truthfully, every person may be at risk of exposure to the coronavirus. However, there are certain workplaces where the exposure, the, the risk is higher. And uh, those are especially for workers who are interacting with persons who may potentially be infected. We also have to keep in mind that since we are all at risk of infection, we need to see who would have more severe disease and workers' individual risk factors for getting a more severe disease. And those include uh, our workers who are of older age, though I must say most of the, the current information shows that adverse outcomes are above 70. Over 60, but definitely over 70. Also, our workers who have chronic medical conditions, including uh, immunocompromising conditions, pregnancy, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, um, all are at higher risk of getting um, morbidity and mortality with this disease. So in terms of high exposure risk groups, um, some that have been identified include airline operators, border controls, of course our healthcare workers, laboratory workers, uh, pathology and funeral service, services, um, people who are involved in waste management, as well as, well as care facilities, all their homes, things like that. Okay, so in terms of mitigate, mitigating um, occupational or hazards in our workforce, um, and here we kind of go back to our usual principles of primary prevention. And in the workplace, in terms of minimizing the risk of transmission in the workplace, and we go to back to our basics with doing a health risk assessment, which kind of allows us to assess the risk and to assess the controls and use controls effectively to mitigate the risk. It's also part of primary prevention also includes business preparedness or the workforce preparedness, having contingency plans, having policies in place. Uh, it also involves education and training and risk communication. With regards to secondary prevention strategies, uh, here we look at early identification of possible workers who uh, are showing signs of disease so that we can respond quickly and appropriately. Um, and early treatment can be, can be um, given to our, those workers and also they would be able to be isolated so to prevent spread to other workers. With regards to tertiary prevention, we don't know what that looks like, but there may be rehabilitative needs that workers had, have after being um, diagnosed with this condition. Um, also compensation issues and leave issues also need to be addressed. Okay, so kind of taking it back in occupational health, I guess we're always guided by our legislation. And our Occupational Health and Safety Act says that um, employers need to provide 
uh, a safe working environment, a safe and hazard-free working environment for employees. And under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, we are also guided by the regulations for hazardous biological agents, uh, and which, which shows us ways that we can prevent in the workplace, but where our mitigation factors uh, fail us, there's also our legislation of the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, which would then allow for compensation, particularly in the case of healthcare workers where it's likely to be um, an occupational transmission or occupational disease. Okay. So preparedness, workplace preparedness for health key workers. Okay. Transmission of COVID-19 to health key workers. It's seen that it, ha it has happened. We have all heard of health key workers that have been affected globally. And it seems to be occurring when standard precautions are not met and basic infection prevention and control measures for respiratory infections are not in place or when people have been handling patients um, and this the in in the way they usually do and um, this case has not been confirmed so they haven't kind of put extra precautions in place however if we use the standard precautions we should be safe okay but we do need to use extra precaution particularly when uh, doing aerosol, uh, aerosol generating procedures like intubation, bagging, um, your CPR, those kind of procedures we do need to be extra careful and we'll talk about it later. So back to the basics we said, we're going to tackle this as any other hazard in the workplace and we need to go back to our risk assessment. So a risk assessment needs to be conducted in all our workplaces to assess the risk of exposure to COVID-19 and like all risk assessments this should be communicated to all workers. But we also need, we, we don't need to, we need to be cognizant that we, we mustn't act in a silo, we mustn't only stick to COVID 19 is our only risk. We have numerous other biological risks within particularly the healthcare setting, physical risks, chemical risks, ergonomic risks, and also probably a lot of psychosocial risks like long exposures to long working hours, psychological distress of, of, of having to look after patients that are extremely sick, uh, fatigue, occupational burnout, stigma of working with patients uh, and then having to go home to our families and friends, uh, as well as there's a potential for physical and psychological violence and abuse within uh, the healthcare facility. So a specific risk assessment, looking at the different jobs and the different uh, exposure levels needs to be done. Okay. And then once we've identified all the risks, we then look at what controls are in place or can be put in place to mitigate the risk. And as always, we, you know, we work from the hierarchy of controls, trying to look at how can we either eliminate firstly or substitute, I wish we could eliminate this virus, but we're not there yet. So then looking at engineering controls, and then administrative controls, and as a last resort, our PPE, which we know we need to use in an appropriate fashion because of the issues around PPE currently. So now looking at the engineering controls. Engineering controls involve isolating employees or trying to separate the employees from um, the hazardous substance in the workplace. And um, these are ideally the best type of control to use because it doesn't rely on the worker's behavior. Uh, and so sometimes can actually be cost effective in the long run to implement. So some of the engineering controls that should be considered for SARS 
um, coronavirus 2. These could include installing high efficiency air filters, increasing the ventilation rooms, uh, the ventilation rates, particularly in the isolation rooms, um, installing physical barriers like sneeze guards or physical barriers like in reception rooms or triage or um, pharmacy to try to protect the workers. Also specialized negative pressure ventilation in some set settings, um, especially the ones that that are high-risk settings, uh, controlling access to high-risk areas within a health, health facility, and uh, rigorous cleaning device or cleaning devices can be also recommended um, as well. Now, in terms of engineering controls, Following engineering controls, when we can't put those in place firstly, we also have to look at the administrative controls. These need to not only be put in place and revised where they already are in place, they need to be re-looked at, but, but the updated versions need to be communicated to employees as well as managers. So everybody needs to know what these administrative controls are. Some of these can include well, all workplaces need a work plan of action for preparedness, um, clear infection prevention and control um, policies, SOPs, standard precaution, SOPs, occupational health policies, and, and I know that oftentimes these are already in place, but they need to be revisited in line with the risks that we now face. We need to look at appropriate and rapid triage and proper placement of patients uh, as quickly as possible, trying to isolate the source to um, protect the workers. We need to look at controlled access like we spoke of earlier. We need to also ensure that there's adequate staff to patient ratios. Uh, look at appropriate working hours, breaks need, that need to be maintained because of the fatigue and psychosocial hazards that are now going to be put on our, our health force. We need to ensure proper signage and risk communication to staff as well as visitors um, and patients within the health facilities. We need to have, uh, for, for our staff that travel, we need to have appropriate and updated travel policies um, that are in line with what the NICD is, is publicizing um, uh, with regards to safe places that, are, that can be visited and also in line with um, what our national policy is now. We need to look at cleaning and disinfectant procedures and SLPs. We need to ensure that safe management practices and procedures are in place. Uh, there needs to be active communication between occupational health or infection control personnel. Uh, they must make points of contact with uh, health authorities so that in the event of an adverse or um, uh, exposure, proper procedures are quickly followed. We, we need to establish within our occupational health um, system uh, public health reporting procedures and we also need to try to foster an environment that is blame-free working environment for our staff so that there's an ease of reporting when symptoms come. Uh, just to prevent and to contain spread. We need to establish and ensure where there isn't that employees have access to employee assistance programs um, to deal with uh, all the psychosocial issues as well. Okay, so part of, of our administrative controls are actually training and education and risk communication to employees as is stipulated in our um, Occupational Health and Safety Act. And so people need to be given facts about what this disease is, 
How is it transmitted? People need to re-look at sometimes be retrained on infection prevention and control strategies, including hand and respiratory hygiene practices. People need to also um, be trained that when using PPE and discarding the PPE that is now being contaminated, it is done in an appropriate way. So correct donning and doffing as well as the disposal of PPE. And um, workers need to be advised on self-assessment in terms of what are the symptoms, uh, how to report, what are the procedures in place to report when, when our healthcare workers are symptomatic, what are sick leave policies that are now being put in place um, for people if they are exposed. People also need to be informed about, um, you know, the benefits of taking influ influenza vaccine. And clear policies, you know, particularly around sick leave need to be established because that seems to be the thing that people worry about a lot in the workplace, understandably. Um, but people shouldn't, however, however that is managed within individual workplaces, People should be punished for staying away for flu. And um, where possible, I know in this setting it's really difficult when we deal with patients, but in other settings, in office settings, also in, in healthcare facilities, um, we need to think about alternative ways of working. And if possible, to work from home, these things should be made available. We need to understand the travel risk for our staff members who do travel and make informed decisions um, based on the, the, the risk benefit of traveling. And just to broadcast the NICD uh, hotline number, these are at the end. For any, any queries, any clinical queries, they should come there. So basically, in terms of minimizing transmission in the workplace, patients need to be isolated. Contact with staff needs to be limited. Contact with going to toilets needs to be, you know, they should have their own toilet. Their movements need to be regulated and limited. Um, and again, I know this has been said so many times in the media, but we can't not say it. We need to promote regular and thorough hand washing by our employees, our contractors, our patients, our visitors. Proper respiratory hygiene needs to be uh, practiced, particularly in a hospital environment. Coughing into your elbow, uh, not touching your face, staying a little bit of a distance away from people, avoid touching your face, especially while you're working. Um, and if anyone is symptomatic, they should stay away. Okay, this is just some information about travel in the workplace and the necessity of doing a risk evaluation before allowing any kind of travel. With regards to medical surveillance, our medical surveillance and the whole purpose of medical surveillance is to ensure early detection of disease, in this case, COVID-19 disease, to be able to facilitate rapid testing and treatment, and then to prevent transmission from a potentially contagious healthcare worker to patients and other colleagues. So it's important sometimes, it's important for hospitals to do the administrative things like uh, maintain a record of all staff who are providing care to confirmed um, cases. And medical surveillance um, should include uh, symptom, uh, looking for monitoring for symptoms, and where necessary, if symptomatic, and people who have been exposed rapid isolation and testing, okay? But this medical surveillance should be determined according to the risk that people are. So it's very specific to the environment and to the worker depending on risk, and it needs to be done at the guidance of the company's 
or the uh, workplace occupational needs in plenty. Okay, so I'm just going to mention some kinds of monitoring that has been um, that has been mentioned in the literature that can be done around COVID disease. Uh, there are some, I'll, I'll give reference to them a little bit later, but there's only one published document, which is an interim guideline from the CDC. And it talks about self-monitoring, active monitoring, or monitoring with it under delegated supervision. Uh, with regards to self-monitoring, it's where the workers monitor themselves by either taking their, feet, their temperature twice a day, and um, checking for respiratory symptoms. But in cases where this is implemented, there needs to be a plan in place of who the, who the employee should contact should they become symptomatic. They've also mentioned active, mo active monitoring, and this is often done by the state or the local public health authority. When pe people who are uh, healthcare workers who are potentially exposed to people, um, and oftentimes the high risk and medium risk are, are healthcare workers who are exposed to confirmed cases and are not uh, wearing PPE, this has been recommended, active monitoring. Um, but the, these kinds of people would meet our case definition and so within the guidelines that we currently follow in South Africa would have active monitoring. Now, self-monitoring with a delegated supervision is where a health, healthcare worker performs self-monitoring by the oversight of their uh, occupational health um, practice. Okay, this is what I spoke about earlier, the interim US guidelines for risk assessment and public health management of healthcare personnel. This is the only guideline that seems to be available at the moment um, from when I checked. And um, it gives a nice, it classifies people according to high risk, medium risk, and low risk, and then gives some recommendations. So, uh, one of the recommendations is it classifies them also if a healthcare worker has had prolonged contact, close contact, with an infected patient, and the patient was wearing a face mask. Then um, if the healthcare worker didn't have any PPE on, uh, he was, or he or she was medium risk, if they were not wearing a face mask or a respirator, so sort of having a respiratory protection, they were also medium risk. If they had a respirator and all the other PPE but just didn't have, have eye protection, they were considered low risk and so on. And so for the medium risk, they recommended active monitoring for these uh, healthcare workers. And this active monitoring uh, meant exclusion, isolation, or uh, quarantine uh, for a period of 14 days after the last exposure. Similarly, if you weren't wearing any respiratory protection. But there's another part of that table that talks about if a healthcare worker has prolonged close contact with an infected patient, and this, this patient is not wearing a face mask. And, uh, and then if the healthcare worker also has no protection, this is a high, um, a high risk. Um, if they are not wearing a face mask or respiratory protection, this is also high risk. If they're not wearing eye protection, it was classified as medium risk. And if they were just not wearing gown or gloves, that was classified as low risk. So with the high and medium, they recommended ex exclusion from work for 14 days, um, looking for symptoms, being monitored, uh, and, and active monitoring. Okay. Now, with regards to uh, PPE, I thought I, I purposely put this last because oftentimes our focus is mainly on the PPE. But PPE is an effective measure in a complete package of mitigation and control strategies. Um, and so we need to ensure, particularly in this climate, that adequate and appropriate PPE is available and is used appropriately. 
Um, and so this needs to be, the PPE that is used needs to be based on the risk assessment. Um, and if there is exposure, in high exposure setting, a single pair of disposable gloves, um, a gown, respiratory protection, which, could in, which would include a respirator um, at certain settings, particularly in aerosol generating procedures, eye protection, which you could include goggles and a disposable face shield that covers not only the front but also the sides. So please remember, uh, spectacles are not uh, PPE and they are not eye protection. Healthcare workers need to be very cautious um, when involved in aerosol generating procedures like intubation, uh, ventilation, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, tracheostomies, bronchoscopies, and yet it's recommended that respirators, eye, protected, eye protection, gowns, gloves, aprons, if the gowns are not fluid resistant, should be. Um, so any PPE that is used needs to be, and, and considered contaminated, needs to be discarded in accordance with safe practices, and um, they need to be dis discarded in appropriate sites. Surgical masks should also be available for patients with respiratory symptoms. Um, so particularly if there's a suspected patient comes in, immediately from the get-go, we need to try to mitigate the source. And so uh, uh, um, a surgical mask should be put on, on the patient. And it's also important to note in our climate where there is not much PPE available, that for asymptomatic individuals, there is no need to wear a mask of any kind. So there's a, a, a nice document um, published by the WHO that talks about the rational use, oh gosh, rational use of PPE for coronavirus. And it takes each setting and each activity that a healthcare worker could be doing within a health facility. And it mentions the type of PPE that is appropriate for the procedure or the activity and, and, and where in the hospital. Um, so this is a nice guidance document that allows us to use, to use our risk assessment and then use the appropriate PPE for the setting and for the task. Okay, so if you suspect you've been exposed, alert your supervisor, the occupational health clinic immediately. And um, if you, you know, you need to try to inform your, or inform your health care provider about any contacts that you may have had if you become symptomatic. If you have any inquiries, particularly around workplace COVID-19 and workplace um, preparedness, workplace um, just guidance or advice, please send your inquiries in writing to info at nrh.ac.za and for any uh, clinical information there is the NICD hotline that is meant 24 7. If you have any queries clinically about either you well about a patient that you may be treating please there is the NICD hotline. Thank you so much. That was um, Dr. Odette Valnik dealing with the latest update on COVID-19 as well as workplace preparedness and prevention. And we focus in particular today on the healthcare workers in our very essential healthcare institutions that we require. I need to maybe just at this point in time mention, I'll repeat it for you again later. In your chat, the bubble at the bottom, if you've joined later in this particular video link, Please add your email address where you can type in the chat bubble, as well as please add any questions you have on the presentations that you've heard thus far. Add your questions to that chat bubble. We will have a question answer session towards the end of this particular video link. 
And then uh, before we move to our next uh, contributor, um, that's on the question of cleaning procedures, particularly in healthcare settings, I need to remind you in the public health sector that um, the Department of Health has issued the following standard operating procedures for a preparedness. I'm going to try and bring it as close as possible to the camera for you to see it. And you should by now have accessed and been uh, provided with this document. Clearly for you as healthcare workers, you would need to have discussed this in detail with regard to what that means for your particular workplace. This is the opportunity where a non-discriminating virus is going to make us talk to each other more and work and collaborate and cooperate with each other more. If we don't do that as a nation, we would not be able to get this virus, the peak at least of the graph, as low as possible. An additional document that uh, Dr. Tanisha Singh reminded me to share with you is that there's just been the issue by the Department of Public Services uh, DPSA, um, this particular document, which you should secure as management and employees and incorporate this also in your internal arrangements. If you provide your email address in the chat group and make an explicit request, we can possibly assist you in getting the document that we have, but remind you you have to speak internally in terms of your internal management and employee structures to ensure that these documents are made available as broadly as possible. We have a huge number of healthcare workers in our country, a huge number of public health sector and private health sector institutions, and the number of people involved on today's video link is a small percentage. We're gonna to have to rely on all of you linked up today to this video link to get the message out there to all of your healthcare worker colleagues in the public and private sector. Uh, we appeal to you that this is the type of uh, scenario that we are faced in and the type of, um, I think, action we need to take to circulate information as broadly as possible so that we can have workplace and occupational specific measures in place, as you just heard from my colleague, um, that is uh, Dr. Odette Valmik. So a reminder, please type your email addresses in the chat um, section and please add any questions you have so that we can have the questions ready. For those who are in larger rooms with uh, video conferencing facilities, can one person please take the responsibility of typing the questions on your computer or laptop that you have linked to this video link and others can write down those questions and pass it along to um, the person who's typing the questions. So just to repeat, the two documents, one is the Department of Health's uh, Standard Operating Procedure document, specific for the scenario. And I want to thank Dr. Siko Senabe, who's in our company here today in the room, who's provided us with support from the Gauteng Department of Health. At this point, I hand over to my colleague, um, and that is uh, Jeanette. Um, Mangani, am I not that right, your surname? That's and it's right. Dr. Makurit. No, no. Not, yet. not yet. Almost there, <laughs> almost there. Uh, to deal with us on the next topic of uh, the cleaning procedures that is applicable in the uh, public health city. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you very much, Ashraf. And I just want to make one correction. The topic that I'm going to talk to you is about respiratory system. So we decided to swap around with my colleague who's going to speak last because the one that I'm going to talk about, it ties well with the first presentation that was made by Dr. Odette. So the reason for my talk is because Dr. Odette spoke about a specific group which may be worried about getting exposed should they perform aerosol generating procedures. So she spoke about the use of N95 respirators which need to be fit tested. So that takes me to the topic or the, the, the presentation that I would like to sensitize you about the concept of respirator fit testing. So this is one of our standard um, slides, which I'm not going to go through. Um, so while I'm complimenting the um, presentation that she has made, I just want to remind those who are in need 
of knowing the protocol of proper donning and doffing. So if you can continue to send your detail and we'll be able to communicate, we'll send you the link on how to do that. But we're not saying that it's a, it's a standardized one. You will have to use it to customize to your setting and that will be based on the risk assessment. So, as um, Dr. Odet has mentioned, PPE use with regard to COVID, it has to be in line with the outcome of the risk assessment. Then seeing that there's still a lot of information which are not known in terms of the virus, then some of the conclusion, if you are not able to make, you can make use of international best practice as your guidelines. However, we do encourage different organizations to have their own internal policies which deal with their specific hazard. In this case, we're talking about COVID-19. So as I've mentioned, so the presentation on respirator use, and I also want to clarify because there's also confusion between respirators and masks. These are two different things. So a mask is a surgical mask that you tie at the back or you hook on your ears. But the respirator we're talking about, N95 or FFP2 in this case is disposable respirators. So my um, audience of interest today is those who are high risk groups. Those are the people that are expected to use the respirators, especially when they perform a result generating procedures. The WHO, they recommended the use of A95 or FFP2. So when it comes to using N95 or FFP2, in order to ensure that these respirators are fitting properly, ideally the organization should have an effective respiratory protection program. But it's not a transmission if that hasn't been started. But I just want to mention that if you have an effective respiratory protection program within your organization, it will cover some elements like policies, which you have management support, employees buy-in. Then you will have a process of helping each other to select suitable respirators. It's either based on the risk assessment, or if the risk assessment show a, a, a number of uh, respirators, employees may be given an opportunity to choose, however, they still need to be protected from the selected respirators. Medical evaluation is also very important because there are people who cannot use the respirators either because they have a breathing problem or they are asthmatic, they, they're claustrophobic. So those kind of things need to be identified earlier, especially if those people would be requested to wear a respirator. Training and information is very important because people need to know the limitation and also they need to know what is it that needs to be done so that they can actually get the protection that they, the respirator can offer. So that brings me to the concept that I want to really talk about today, which is the concept of respirator fit testing. So respirator fit testing, again, is often confused with two other concepts. Some people think we're talking about a seal check. It's not correct. Seal check, we're talking about when you have worn a respirator, you want to make sure that it's sitting properly every day or every time you put a respirator or you read down. So you can do a seal check. So another confusing concept, people think we're talking about filtration efficiency. Again, that is not what I'm talking about today. Filtration efficiency is when you want to check the material of the respirator, how much it filters particle based on the design or the purpose of its function. So for you to be able to follow me perfectly, I just want you to understand what is respirator system. So we are talking about the test that help us to specify which type, model, or size of a respirator that can adequately fit a specific individual. So in other words, we don't fit test one person and we make an assumption that a group will be fitted by that kind of a respirator or a size. So each and every individual needs to go through the process. 
So seeing that now our group is healthcare workers, if you will be expected to use a respirator to perform those procedures, which are likely to expose you then um, to, to an agent, then it is very important that you are fit tested using the respirator that is likely to fit you to confirm whether it's fitting or not. So why are we conducting respirator fit testing? So we want to confirm if the respirator provides a fit or a seal or a barrier between the user or even the contaminated. In this case, we're talking about a case, an infected case or the procedure which will really expose you directly um, to a, a virus itself through droplet infection. So it also, this procedure of respiratory fit testing, it also allow us to, for refresher training on correct donning of the respirator. We do understand that even people have been trained, then if with time they take it for granted to put it correctly, or maybe they become wary or lazy, then during respiratory fit testing, we tend to encourage people to, to do, to put the respirator correctly. So that way they are able to be sensitized. If you are issued a respirator as an employee, and if it fits you, it gives you a confidence that you are protected by the supplied equipment and you are likely to use it. So you may be asking yourself, when are you supposed to conduct respirator fit testing? Like I've mentioned, if you haven't done it in your organization, it's not a problem. Then it, is, it can be done anytime. But ideally, you need to do it during the initial selection of a respirator. In other words, if you are expected to use a respirator, you need to do fit testing so that you are meshed with the correct type. Then when a new hazard is identified, so in this case, it's very relevant. We have COVID-19. You were not wearing a respirator before, but now you are expected to use a respirator because of the certain procedure that you're going to perform and it may, you may be at the potential risk of getting infected. So in this case, in, as part of preparedness, you will need to do fit testing. Again, later on, you can do it as part of refresher training. So, well, uh, we, we receive many questions on who can do it. Then anyone who has knowledge and training. So you can identify someone within your organization or you can outsource the, 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 the function. So, as you can see, there, there are two methods that can be used to conduct respirator fit testing, qualitative and quantitative. Then, uh, looking at the resource constraints because of the shortage of uh, PPE, including respirators, the CDC has, um, is recommending the use of qualitative fit testing since it minimizes the destruction of respirators which are used during the process of fit testing. We are not advocating for any method, but we are saying that whichever is accessible to you, please make use of that as long as the concept get implemented. So however, there are factors which you need to be aware of that may affect a fit of the respirator. Despite fit testing or the correct type of a respirator, you need to be aware of these factors. So if you have facial hair or you have beards, there is no way that the respirator can fit you. So that way it means respirator fit testing cannot really confirm the type or the size of respirator which can fit you because there's an external factor here. So again, incorrect donning of a respirator. If you are fit tested and you, you, you achieved a good fit on a specific size or type, if you happen to put it incorrectly, you are likely not to be protected from that respirator. We have um, um, different sizes. The two that we spoke about, uh, the N95 come in two sizes currently. The FFP2 come in one size. So people need to be aware of different sizes because you may be likely to get a good fit on a small size as opposed to a medium. So respirator fit testing also can help you to really identify those kind of sizes and you match them to um, individuals accordingly. 
if you have facial deformities around the seal areas, so again, maybe it can be an injury from an accident and so forth, you need to confirm whether that, um, that part or which is affecting the seal area, is it really leaving a gap which is affecting the seal completely around your face size. So you need to do fit testing in order to, con uh, to confirm that. Compatibility with other equipment. I, I think if you remember, um, Dr. Odette spoke about other equipment. Say for example, you're wearing all the equipment for the procedure that is relevant for your job profile. It, it's important that you know when you should put a respirator in before the classes, after the class. So it's very important because other equipment may have an influence on how the respirator can be seen properly. So someone needs to know the proper donning and doffing so that you are aware of what needs to be put first. Multiple donning and doffing of respirator can also be an influence because by the time you wear it again, and depending on the um, environmental condition, if it's, uh, it's hot and humid, it can affect the, the, the integrity of the equipment or the respirator itself, and it may not see properly after a number of multiple domains. So um, there is a concept that I also want to um, clarify here in terms of respirator reuse. We are all aware if um, all of you who joined have used respirators before, all those boxes which comes with respirators, they are written single use only. But I mean, it's not realistic considering the resource constraints with the situation at hand. That's why it's very important that the organization need to develop internal policies, which they will make sure that respirators in the process of them being reused, they need to prevent contamination during doffing and storage. CDC um, they have a strategy for optimizing the supply of respiratory protective equipment. They are encouraging people for extended use. In other words, instead of multiple donning, you can use it longer, uh, up to four hours. But again, you also need to think about the issue of discomfort. So, it is very important that the issue of risk assessment get very much, um, the organization need to pay attention because all these things need to be developed in-house so that there aren't any issues around reuse of respirators. So um, I just want to conclude by saying that respirator fit testing is very important. If you don't do it, it means that you will be wearing a respirator that may not be protecting you. In other words, if the respirator user match is not checked, there may be an unsatisfactory fit around the user, even if the correctly selected respirator is worn, especially for the hazards or the papers. So if you do respirator fit testing, we can have assurance that we can reduce exposure or we can minimize transmission to inhalation or to, to hazard, in this case, to droplets, infection, and in respirators users, thus we are reducing the potential for, for infection. So thank you very much. If you want to learn more about the concept, I have listed sources of information where I have extracted my slides from. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge the following people. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm just having a quick look here on the um, my uh, laptop uh, link to the video link. And I see that some of you have already asked questions. We'll get to that in a moment. We're encouraging the rest of you. Please add your email addresses to the chat. That's at the bottom of the bar, the little bubble. If you click it, you can add and type your email addresses and type your questions. Uh, for those of you who have a large group of people, the person who's manning the laptop or PC that's connected to your data projector and your link to this video link, please send, write your questions and send to that person so we can have your questions at the later stage. I must move on immediately to invite my colleague, Ms. Alinka Matuka, and she will, she's from the immunology and microbiology section. Uh, she'll be dealing with the cleaning procedures. Thank you, Alinka. Thank you.
morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present to you cleaning procedures. Okay, um, for our introduction, the use of correct disinfectants is important in preventing and reducing the spread of disease, such as COVID-19. Disinfectants may not work on all surfaces because you do get different uh, surfaces, such as your porous one, for example, in your case that is bedding in your hospitals. You get your semi-porous surfaces as well as non-porous surfaces. Usually disinfectants, uh, it seems to work uh, more effectively on non-porous surfaces, which is why those surfaces are usually recommended in workplace settings. Some disinfectants can also be toxic. Therefore, the workers that using the chemicals needs to be provided with PPE, appropriate PPE for dealing with disinfectants. And they can also be expensive. Uh, that's the reason why the users need to work together with procurement services or their financial departments in order to budget for such chemicals. The World Health Organization and Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommend that appropriate disinfectants with proven activity against enveloped viruses be used to minimize the risk of transmission of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. Examples of such active ingredients include hypochlorite, also known as bleach or jig, alcohol, which should at least be 60% and upwards, up to 95%, as recommended by WHO, then hydrogen peroxide, phenolic compounds, as well as quaternary ammonium compounds. The latter one, the QAC, you'll see on later slides, it's been listed as the most common ingredients under the list of EPA for registered disinfectants. So when you get the three agents, they can either come concentrated, whereby you need to dilute at a certain ratio, or you get them diluted where you can use them readily. So therefore, the user must make sure they follow the manufacturer instruction or pay attention to the product label, as that will also guide you on the application of the product. So we get surface disinfectants that comes either in the form of liquids or powder which you need to dilute further in the water. Then you can also get surface wipes. However, there's one study that was done that has reported that surface wipes may not be effective for surface cleaning. So it's up to the user also to make sure that they look at the ingredients of that and how, how effective that is. Also taking into consideration that surface wipes can also dry out quicker, which can affect your contact time. So the frequently charged surfaces needs to be disinfected regularly, such as your shared equipment or undedicated equipment, like in the settings, some people change the instrument, they move it from one area to another. Those needs to be decontaminated. De your doorknobs, your bathroom seats, your basins and taps and so on. As for hands disinfection, you find them in the form of antimicrobial soaps, hand gels, as well as hand wipes. The hands needs to be clean at the door, especially in healthcare settings and also at the regular intervals. I'm sure you're all familiar with the five moments of, of hand hygiene, where you need to wash your hands or clean your hands before uh, touching a patient, after touching a patient, or even before 
handling your food during lunchtime. It's important to make sure your hands are clean. And for hand gels, after applying it and rubbing it between your hands, it must be allowed to dry. And there is no um, necessity to rinse your hands afterwards. So we must also know that the user must also follow the proper washing techniques as recommended by WHO. So dirty surfaces need to be cleaned with a detergent or soap before disinfection takes place to remove the soil or the dirt on the surface. And disposable gloves must be worn during the process of cleaning and disinfection. And after use, the gloves must be disposed of properly. If reusable gloves are used, they should be dedicated to, for that certain procedure. They, they mustn't be used in other areas in order to avoid cross contamination from one area to another. And the healthcare settings or institution must ensure that there's adequate supply of clean material. As Janet has mentioned, with the lack of resources, for PPE, we also find out that there's lack of resources for cleaning material. So being the risk um, group, we have to ensure that we have enough supply that can take us for a while. And hand hygiene supply should also be accessible, especially where uh, the healthcare workers are dealing with patients and where they also change their uh, PPE. So important notes to remember is that the effectiveness of cleaning agents is dependent on several factors. And those include the concentration used of the disinfectants. You'll see some certain products will show on the outside of the container the effectiveness in which they can kill the organism. For example, your 99.9%, some will have 95, depending on the, on the concentration that has been tested for effectiveness. And then some will tell you on how to dent. So you need to pay attention on how much of, of, of the disinfectant you have to dilute with how much of the water. So the volume in this case plays an important role because if you're not following those instructions, we're not sure of the effectiveness, then you'll be cleaning, but the disinfectant won't be doing what it's supposed to do. The active ingredients, as mentioned, as recommended by WHO, is also important because some work quicker than the others, which minimizes the contact time. Depending on the activity that you do, you will choose the disinfectant with the contact time that you know will be suitable for the type of activity that you do. Storage conditions as well is critical. The temperature at which you store your, your disinfectants can also play a role in, in, in loss of activity. Either the, the disinfectant will lose activity and not do what it's supposed to do. The method of application is also important, which is why it's always important to refer to the MSDS to see how the chemical work and also the label on the container. Some, like your hand gels, will tell you, because you need to squirt on your, 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 your hand, will tell you put at least two mils of hand gel. Now, because you don't know exactly how much is two mils, before you apply or use the hand gel, it will be advisable that you measure at least approximately how much is two meals, so that when you just quit as your work, will you always be like rushing to do uh, look after the patient. At least you know more or less what, how much going to put on. I've mentioned that the importance of contact time. You'll see on the next slide also I've put example from the EPA, EPA list, which show different types of contact time. Contact time is the time it takes for the disinfectant to remain on surface. So, which means that the surface has to be wet for it to kill or the disinfectant to be able to kill the target microorganism. And some containers you see also complies with certain uh, standards. 
So it will be written either written in the MSDS or, or the package instead, or it, it will be on the container itself. So those are critical also to they guide you on the quality of the products that you're purchasing and you're going to use. And lastly, safety consideration when using disinfectants have to be taken. Uh, um, we have to pay attention on that. And all the information about safety, whether the ke chemical or dis disinfectant is corrosive or can be harmful, uh, what precautionary measures to take and what PPE to wear, all that information you will find on the material data safety sheet. If you're getting the disinfectant and you don't have that, you can always contact the supplier and request for the MSDS. So after using the disinfectant, the user or the healthcare worker must make sure they wash their hands and also ensure that they moisturize their hands in order to prevent other skin problems such as skin irritation on the hands. When disinfecting or decontaminating the rooms or areas, it is recommended that adequate ventilation is ensured in the room in order to prevent inhalation of the residual chemicals that will be floating in the room to protect the worker. So you can either use open windows or if there is mechanical ventilation that can be used as well. With open windows, you can supplement that also with a fan to, to, to um, support like influence air movement, airflow in the room. Most importantly, users should be trained on how to use these chemicals and also how to don and doff the PPE as by the previous speaker. And also that what type of PPE to use. When you're using harsh chemicals, for example, you have to have to use the appropriate gloves which can be resistant to the chemicals when it comes into to the labs when it comes into contact with it. And the right respirator as well for chemicals. So this is just examples which I've extracted from the list of registered dis disinfectants with EPA, just to show you the difference of the active ingredients. You see here the active ingredient is quaternary ammonia, which I've mentioned in the previous slides. The contact time for that will be 10 minutes. And it is dilutable. Since I've mentioned that you get the ones that you can dilute, you get the undiluted ones. Then you see there's different types of products, maybe from different suppliers, but they have the same active ingredient. However, the identification number will be different. So we as well as we purchase, it will be different suppliers, but you must pay attention to the active ingredient that's in that product. So you see here another recommended one by WHO and CDC is hydrogen peroxide. The contact time for that one is one minute. So when you're using, for example, doing procedures that means like fast um, turnaround times, for example, then you would rather use this because it won't delay you as when you're using the one with the longer turnaround times, longer contact time. So these are just the recommended sites to get more information because there's plenty of information and full details on the different disinfectants of what, which organisms they target, their contact time, their uh, health effects they can cause, and so on. Thank you. Monica, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that contribution. So, that was our essentially our panel who will join me in a moment here to engage with the question answer session. So we've had uh, Dr. Tanisha Singh, who's the head of the NIH's immunology, immune, uh, immunology, slight pause there and a bit of a breath, and microbiology section. So Dr. Tanisha Singh is also the chairperson 
of the NIH's COVID-19 outbreak response team and responsible for organizing as one of the activities these many video links, including some resource materials, posters, and so on, that is um, for general and occupational specific uh, information. Specifically, workplace preparedness and prevention. Our second uh, speaker was uh, Dr. Odette Volming from the NIH's Occupational Medicine section, and she dealt with the latest update of the COVID-19, the COVID-19 workplace preparedness and prevention. And then we were joined by um, Ms. Jeanette Mangani, who's the head of our occupational hygiene section at the NIOH. And she spoke about the appropriate use of respirators and the guidance she provided there. And then finally, we had Ms. Onika Matuka, also from the immunology and microbiology section of the NIOH, and sharing with us how can we ensure that the contact transmission uh, means that the virus uses is uh, mitigated, the prevention takes place, and what the cleaning procedures are that we need to take, uh, put into place in our health sector. I'm now going to ask my colleagues to join us, please, here in front, and to sort of line up on my left hand side to cover this very blank wall, which we need to do something about. <laughs> um, so then we can deal with the questions and answers. Um, step from sort of all sides and just move more to the left. A little bit more. No, a little bit more. Thank you for joining. Um, so let me just get some of the questions and our colleagues from our IT department for whom, oops, that I must thank a lot. <laughs> I'll move over to the other side. Uh, that's Glenn and Tabani, who's supporting us with all the technology here. A great thanks to the IT department of the National Institute for Occupational Health. So, as you notice, our competent team of women, highly specialized, highly qualified, I'm proud to be there, have seated the old man in the chair. <laughs> Because I've got to read my questions that you see. Okay, so uh, the first question that we've received, um, colleagues, were from uh, Timbok Kwashi Zatwe. And Timbok Kwashi wants to know how safe is it to perform a lung function test uh, for employees during occupational health medical surveillance, as it is one of the tests we do as occupational health nursing practitioners? I think that is a, a common question that keeps arising and um, you know we, we go back to kind of basic principles in terms of doing a health risk assessment first, looking at the ventilation of the room, you know just doing a complete health, health risk assessment um, for the uh, whoever is the one who is going to be performing the lung function test um, and then making an assessment on that. Um, you know there are there are times that, you know, in this time, there, there, there seems to be that, um, you know, if it is a dangerous procedure, if you are blowing for prolonged periods of time and you don't have a well-ventilated room, uh, any other controls in place, you need to make that risk. You, you need to do that risk assessment. And if the risk is too great for the employee, and it is a, you know, it is just a routine task that is that has been done. Then um, things need to be looked at, and maybe it is not wise to do the lung function testing that setting. So we need to protect that worker. Yeah. So in all fairness, let me go back to the first person. That's Vijay Nunda who submitted a question. I started in the middle. Uh, with respect to social distancing, is the recommended distance two meters or one meter apart? Do you want to go yeah. so, so, so based on um, you know the, what's happening in the workplace, we, we are saying one to two meters. One meter, obviously, the direct contact between persons. But you need to do, you need to do the risk assessment and look at the activities that's being done. Uh, so, like uh, Odette presented, the danger zone can be up to four meters. So any so you 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 will be informed. In, uh, by the risk assessment in terms of the activity and what we need to put in place. But direct contact, one meter, and then the danger zone up until four meters. And so with COVID-19, my sense is 
do you risk assessments are required by everybody? Absolutely. Even though that is a significant change. Yes, absolutely. Everybody needs to go back and leave you their risk assessment. Yeah. So for us in the healthcare setting, please, management, employees, all occupational categories within healthcare setting, to have a dialogue, have a discussion, make decisions so that we can ensure that our risk assessments are up to date and that it, in fact, makes provision for COVID-19 as an additional biological hazard in our workplace. The next question is, can we use vitamin C as a method to prevent or reduce infection? Um, I haven't seen any literature on that. You know, um, you know, it's always advisable to keep your immune system up, but there isn't any literature supporting that any anything can prevent um, uh, people out there getting the illness if they are exposed. In fact, if I can just follow it, I think it's important for us to keep our immune system strong and particularly also consider those family members and colleagues who may have compromised immune systems, how we make sure we protect them. The next question is, um, how did the transmission happen between bats, camels, and human beings? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> As I understand it, I'm, you know, I'm not a microbiologist or biologist by any stretch. But as I understand it, the, 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 the virus mutates a lot. And at some point, I mean, there's many viruses that are in animals that, you know, pass through animals. Um, and animal systems have learned to have developed an immune response to it. But a virus, even like the flu virus, it constantly mutates. And that's why we can never get one vaccine every year that will sort out the flu because it's always changing and there's different strains coming up. But, um, and so that's how I, how I understand that it works. So it, it's initially a virus that only goes from animal to animal, the receptors are only on animals, but at some point the organism mutates and then this allows it to now uh, be transmitted to a human being. I think also the, the juxtaposition between animal and human being as we um, uh, interact more closely with animals and consuming exotic animals that allows room for these organisms to skip and hop into the uh, other species, so from animal to human. Um, we understand it originated in the bat and then um, in, in terms of COVID-19 from the bat, then there was um, some literature saying it could be into the snake and then the pangolin. Hmm. Well, the one question that I have uh, missed and I just need to add now is do antibiotics assist with a viral infection mentioned by the speaker as part of the treatment? Very, very good question, very good question because it's very unusual. You know, um, antibiotics, as you know, should, you know, should not be used for viruses. That is just part of the guidelines in terms of treatment options and the regime of treatment for severe patients that will be followed. It could be in light that there are different, you know, differential diagnoses that need to be excluded. Um, but uh, maybe for more information, look at the NICD guidance document for COVID-19, uh, because that's where the treatment that I got came from, as, long as well as the WHO document. Yes, so we would hopefully put that slide up again just towards the end so that you can see where the NICD website is for you to secure some of the resources that we require in this state uh, of disaster. So the next question is, um, can testing be done at NIH or NHLS? Um, any plans to train occupational health and safety personnel on testing? So at this stage, the testing is currently being done at the NICD. Um, the NHLS is uh, working on um, uh, increasing capacity in the NHLS labs. There are designated sites and that will be communicated in due course. Uh, and uh, there is also a plan to scale up testing in the private sector. So for now, uh, NICD and then there will be availability in the NHLS lab but not in our nature this stage. Okay. Um, on the question from Besa, did we not have individuals that were asymptomatic and, need, and tested positive? They were asymptomatic and tested positive. 
I think there have been such cases. That would be globally. Yes, such yes. cases that have been reported and written up. Um, yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. They, they, they have been asymptomatic people. Would it be my understanding that it's unlikely that we'd have cases like that in resourced, challenged environments like our own, uh, and that people would effectively only be tested through the normal mechanisms if they show symptoms? It's kind of clear that, you know, it's anybody's guess how this plays out. You know, in places like South Korea, they're doing like, um, I think 20,000 tests a day. And so they're testing, you don't have to be symptomatic or asymptomatic. So, um, so they are finding those cases. So uh, we, you know, it just it depends on, on, on what, what our national health um, plans are. Thank you. Just yeah, to add to that, there's a very small percentage of people that are asymptomatic mm. uh, that um, test oh. positive, you know. And we must also know that um, asymptomatic people, there's a very low chance of them being mm. infectious um, compared to those that are symptomatic. And is that related to the mode of transmission? Yes. Dropper transmission, transmission, coughing, sneezing, and so on. Okay, so um, the next question, does spirometry technicians need to wear PPE? Okay, I think that's very similar to the first one, and I think we really need to go back to our risk assessment for that worker. Uh, look at the environment, look at the, if there's any controls, if there's anything else to mitigate before we go into PPE, which should always be our last resort. But I think that if you've looked at all that and you've assessed the list, risk is low, you know, it may be a good idea to use PPE. Right. Our next question is regarding the contact tracing and management. When do they get eligible for testing? When they present with symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So people would be traced, they would be identified, and the question of social distancing would be relevant in that scenario and the regular update. In fact, people need to monitor themselves. Yeah, and there's, uh, there's tools for that, yes. Okay. So, um, people who have been identified that need to have contact tracing would be isolated firstly, and then if they do develop symptoms, they would be constantly monitored at the moment, they are monitored by ICD. When they develop symptoms, they would be tested, and if positive, treatment options. And another question from Vania Farouk. Are we going to use the same test criteria for healthcare practitioners and people in general? As, as for mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. just as in diagnosis. Well, um, that's my understanding. If it's diagnosis, mm -hmm. they will follow the same procedure. Yeah. Currently, there's been no, no, no saying that they would work in the other way. Yeah, my sense is the mechanism that the virus used determines the nature of the test, and that would be applicable to all human beings that may be exposed. Unless they're asking about, because we have two separate hotlines mm -hmm. for, um, NICD. For, for healthcare workers and yes. for the public, that's only for to manage properly and to right. pay attention to Yes, the resources are been overwhelmed from time to time, so there is more resources arriving, including the Department of Health WhatsApp support line. And in terms of currently, people who are being tested are those who, who um, are defined by the case definition. Mm. The case definition includes close contacts and healthcare workers mm. um, if they have been in contact and with, with, um, without wearing PPE with any infected individual. Thank you for that. I think what's important here mm -hmm. is one of the healthcare practitioners to report should they know they came into contact, contact with a positive person or even if they become symptomatic immediately. And it's important for us to understand in each of our institutions what is that reporting procedure mechanism um, and person and method of reporting. Am I at home? Am I self? Um, is social distancing mechanism in place already? And how do I communicate to who? If I'm at the workplace, as the just indicated as well, what is the procedure for communicating the change in health status? The next question is, um, oh, well, this is not a question, and many of you have asked this, for us to kindly share the documents from the Department of Health Standard Operating Procedure and the DPSA document. 
we are going to, from now onwards, endeavor to get somebody, whilst we're busy with the session, to actually harvest all your email addresses from the chat group. Hopefully our IT session can assist us with this and email you the documents while we live. Um, we will endeavor to do that maybe as a next step of upping our learning by doing through video link. The next question, um, if um, I think uh, Glenn has assisted me already, um, according to the DPSA circular, if an employee who has traveled abroad to the United States and has been tested for COVID-19 and results came back negative, is it due to return to work and is due to return to work this week? Is there a need for the employee to quarantine as a precautionary measure? Um, let's uh, start with that question. There is a follow-up on there. I think that's an interesting question. I think as far as I know, you know, all, all people who have traveled at the moment are now, you know, it's, there's a directive that people must self-quarantine. And then testing is, is, you know, I see this person has been tested, but I think as the director goes, you self-quarantine, and then you watch for symptoms, and if you do become symptomatic, then you test, um, and then, now, in terms of a negative result, it doesn't always mean that um, you, 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 you aren't affected, because you can then go on to get a positive result. And that's why there's that 14 day period, because it allows for the incubation of the, of the virus and then it become active and multiplying, and then it can be detected and then uh, produce a positive result. So, um, yes, I think that 14 days is actually important to be aware of. I would think if the worker have tested uh, negative, the laboratory, testing laboratory will also advise on whether the person is ready to go to work or not. Mm -hmm. Well, we clearly need the procedures, the standard operating procedures to be in place in your workplace so that you and management understand that and be guided by the documents of the National Department of Health, the Department of uh, Public Services, um, as DPSA, etc. Um, the the follow-up part there from Alex, uh, was employee is working in a public hospital as an occupational therapist. What does that mean in a public sector scenario? Would we rely on the systems and operating procedures as applicable in the public sector, particularly guided by the Department of Health? Mm -hmm. So just clarify again. Um, the particular employee that has now returned from the US is working in a public hospital um, and in a particular occupational yeah. setting. And I know it does put strain on the, you know, the, the healthcare system. Um, but for now, uh, and the, you know, those, the, that is what we've got to follow, you know, there's even a director from our president. So um, I think that's part of the contingency planning that kind of needs to go in, um, in these healthcare facilities. Facilities. When we're thinking about the policies, our SOPs, our action plans, we need to think about what's going to happen when a lot of our staff are sick. Mm. We need to we need to have contingency plans in place, looking at our uh, resources for health, um, trying to make accommodations where where possible. So, how easy to, how easy is it to implement all of this, especially? under these circumstances, and I would assume the circumstances would be state of disaster, um, and I would assume much broadly within the context of our own national situation. I think, yeah, I, I think to be honest, it's not easy, but it's not, not impossible. It's doable. I think we need to all work collectively, share resources where we can, share material where we can, and if institutions form a COVID uh, team, that can collaborate and collectively work together that will help to implement this. Uh, yeah. and, and, and maybe just to add, Tanusha, that under these circumstances, um, I, I think it's in our human nature for us to rise to the challenge. Failure to rise to the challenge in dealing with a state of disaster, um, as we haven't, uh, some have speculated, uh, subject to the, you know, the growth of uh, infection rates and so on, it might become a state of emergency. That would impose more on our um, rights as uh, citizens of South Africa. And I think we need to, in, in fact, put as much as possible into these efforts. Nobody can, in fact, be 
an observer in this environment. Nobody can be sitting on the sidelines hoping that somebody else is going to resolve this for us. This requires all of us, every single employee, every single management person, every single citizen, employed or unemployed, to be able to inform ourselves, to be assisted with the necessary information for us to rally as a nation and make sure that the COVID-19 matter doesn't leave us devastated when it is done and gone. We should emerge from this way much stronger. The NIH, the National Institute for Occupational Health, is certainly making our contribution towards this effort. And we call upon everybody else, as called upon on Sunday evening by the State President, for us to all make those contributions. So next, um, I, just, I just wanted to add that just in terms of, um, you know, what a priority healthcare workers are. Because not only, are, you know, sadly they are at risk, but also they are on the front line of the fight. And so it's important, I know it's going to be difficult to sort it out and to get everything in place. And, you know, we need to do the best we can so that um, our health system doesn't collapse. You know, we need, we need healthcare workers now. And you are essential frontline workers and you need to take care of yourselves as well and ensure that we uh, can make the maximum contribution over the longest period of time. We have not yet, in my understanding, I'm a layperson, reached the peak of our growth in South Africa with regard to the COVID-19 virus. And we need to conserve ourselves to some extent to ensure that we can keep our public health and private health services going. The next question is subsequent to the President's speech on Sunday, declaring a state of disaster and making many other announcements, including the closure of schools from tomorrow. Um, are we now testing everyone that has traveled, not only limited to case criteria? No, as, as um, what the guidance is, is that people uh, self-quarantine, those who have traveled, they uh, need to monitor for symptoms. If they do become symptomatic, they then need to contact their healthcare worker who will then um, look if they fulfill the criteria and uh, advise on testing. Okay. Our next question is, will it be possible to share the PPPs used to, okay, apologies. That was a separate question. Yes, for those people who've not yet sent your emails, please type that into the Zoom group chat that you are now logged into um, so that we can share the documents that many of you as participants have requested from us. Our next question, is it safe to conduct medical surveillance? Audio involves sharing of headphones to do the lung function test. One can be exposed. Um, can we perhaps start with that? There is a follow-up question. Okay. Um, you know, I think I think we just kind of go back to, to our basic principles. It can be a route of exposure, for sure. It's contact with people who are using these things, you know. There are ways to, you know, we need to look at as they're mitigating, as they as the ways to control it, as they're cleaning procedures that can be done. Are there any other alternatives? Um, and look at that risk. If there are not enough alternatives for the risk that we are putting the, the worker in, then we need to really look at the surveillance plans. Yes, and clearly if you need further advice on that, we do have the email address of the NIOH, and if I could just read that to you, it's over on the slides, and we probably show that slide uh, again uh, before we close. It is info at nioh.ac.za. Um, we could type that perhaps into the text, and thank you, Tabani, is about to just add that to the chat. And please, before you log off, if you need to copy that, please do so or write it down. The, the next question that's asked as a follow-up to that one, team, um, was the question of, um, if I can just find it for a moment, there we go. Um, there we go. That's the one. That's the one. Lucia. Lucia's question. Go slightly down. There we go. Um, so, what measures can one follow in order to prevent being exposed during medical surveillance? Uh, 
um, is this, this I'm assuming for the for the the, the person who is doing the medical surveillance. Yes. I think that you know we need to look at all measures of control. We need to start with the engineering controls, the ventilation in the room. Um, then we need to kind of go on to the administrative controls in terms of cleaning practices and things like that that we could potentially do. Um, and then lastly, PPE, depending on you know uh, if the person is at risk. Okay. So I think we should go back to our hierarchy of control. Yes, um, and I think in these slides that Odette had also shared was the three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and that's critical to apply when we do the risk assessment in order to determine the hierarchy of control measures given the hazard that we're dealing with. Um, that's the area where I should be asking my colleague Jeanette to expand on as well, but for now let's go to the next question from Sister Nontlantla. Uh, at Pick It Up, uh, if a health personnel get the COVID virus, COVID-19 at work, uh, do you follow the route of injury on duty, um, which is so called WCA, the yes. Compensation for Occupational Injury Diseases Act provisions? Yes. Uh, if, a, if a healthcare worker is, is, is at high risk, um, then many other workers for getting it through their workplace interactions. And so, in that case, it would be an occupational disease, an occupational infection. On the date of diagnosis. Uh, yes, and then, um, and then procedures need to be followed for putting through the claim. Also, it's important to note that, that those kind of compensation, we look at, um, and oftentimes, the compensation part of it is paid for impairment. So, it looks down the line, you know, and how is this person um, functioning after the infection to see whether or not you know payment can be made but if an occupational disease is suspected and it would be suspected in a healthcare worker who has you know been working in an environment where COVID patients come in and out they the procedure they need to be reported to the yeah, and clearly compensation benefits and payment also go for treatment costs Yes, that's correct. Okay. The next question is the security guards wearing the same gloves, are they not contributing to the spreading of the virus as they open doors, etc.? Okay. I think it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it, it goes to the concept of PPE reuse. Then I think you need to establish why are they using gloves and if they are using gloves they should really try to prevent contaminating other services by reusing. So, I mean, there are other means of not really contaminating their hands, sanitizers, and so forth. But we have seen lately everyone is wearing a respirator or gloves, but they don't change them. I think it's more risky to reuse and not preventing contamination than not using those PPE and use other alternative means. So it is important to train the security on the proper procedures to follow. And as mentioned, sanitizers, hand sanitizers is another option of using mm -hmm. because it will be impractical mm -hmm. to change gloves every now and then. Yes. And critical, obviously, is that risk assessment. You now require a new COVID-19 influenced risk assessment in order to address these questions that my colleagues have been guiding you on. Um, so now, with regard to the uh, donning and doffing protocol, we will be sharing with you the resources. That's why it's important. And will probably be a video resource. Um, we have a video resource. However, we may need to perhaps improve on the quality of it in order to share with you. So please put your email addresses in the group the chat so that we can communicate with you going forward. How can we disinfect the air in the room? Is that required? At the moment, we're not really sure. There is some studies that have reported possible uh, uh, bone transmission, but we're not sure at the moment. But there are options if you need to decontaminate the air. The, you get the devices that can do surface decontamination as well. So they are like your UVGI devices. 
can be used in homes yeah. for that purpose. Thanks, Tamisha. There are also some high risk activities, as Odette pointed out, that can um, create a, a aerosols. And in that case, you may want to uh, decontaminate. One thing is to look at upping the ventilation, uh, diluting the particles from the air, and then there's filtration, and as I mentioned, uh, ultraviolet uh, to inside air radiation. Um, you can have these portable devices available, and you can have upper UGI that's available. And, and with the air conditioning system in those limited scenarios where it might be aerosolized, also be important to consider? Uh, yes. Okay. But I also think um, you find that um, some procedures are happening in a room where natural ventilation is easily accessible. Yes. Yeah. They just need yes. to open the windows. Yes. The first price. The, the, question, the question came from a pick it up uh, participant. Would it be applicable in that environment? Pick it up in a. My sense is a solid waste uh, removal. Mercury? Uh, are they talking about maybe they have an uh, OH clinic where they see patients and the companies pick it up? Uh, well, or is this outside? If that put our participant could perhaps just add that onto the group chat, we move on to the next question and respond to that. Regarding the contact tracing and management, when do they get eligible for testing? Did I cover that earlier? You may have. Yes, yes. I think so I did. Similar. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, are we going to use the same test criteria for, we have covered this. Yeah, I think we need to just check right at the bottom. If, okay, are the gown recommended at a clinic setting? Uh, if yes, are they reusable and uh, how are they cleansed? What type of gowns? I'm not sure. Could we speak maybe about one or two examples? So it seems to be a clinic are setting. They, um, are, they, are they required? Um, it depends on what kind of procedures they're doing. So one of the really good resources there is that WHO documents. It's at the last, last slide. It talks about our patient, our patient department, what kind of procedures, what PPE to use. So it'll guide nicely, you know, uh, because it does, there is contact spread, so it can go on your clothes. So uh, in some circumstances, a gown is recommended. But depending on the task, depending on where you are and your risk assessment of what is actually in your city. Right. Okay. So you may have to follow up us with us on info at nih.ac.za. And if you send your questions there as well, your follow-up questions, we might incorporate it into our frequently asked questions, our FAQ documents that is developing on an ongoing basis. So if we found any suspects uh, or suspect, I would assume when you say suspect, you probably uh, um, people who you may consider to perhaps uh, have COVID-19 infection already. Um, at our clinics, where must we send them for further management? I think um, I think within your specific locations, you need to um, look at what referral pathways there are. Um, uh, it's something that I can't I can't answer on this side. I think it's very specific to your clinics and to which catchment areas you you, um, you service, and then which are the hospitals and stuff that will accommodate um, your. The patients from your centers. And there are a list of they dedicated are, hospitals solutions. Yes, there are, and, and uh, I think it's important in that uh, instance to contact the NICD hotline. Yeah. They will give you guidance on where to send the patient. I think it's a critical question you ask, and each organization must have a very clear flow diagram that indicates what happens if somebody comes and says, I'm not feeling well what you do after that, including eventually when you refer uh, the suspected case to the NICD and when testing is required. Or somebody calls from home uh, where there's been an agreement for social distancing saying, I was okay when I started my social distancing staying at home and now I'm starting to feel the following symptoms. Your flow diagram for your organization needs to be valid by you and if you need assistance with that, you should request such assistance. Um, the NIH can assist and support you in that process as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The next question from Zanele is, is it necessary for the admin staff uh, of working in the reception 
to wear masks and gloves? I think uh, it also go back to the risk assessment because when you do job specific risk assessment, you would include your admin. If you anticipate that they will have to be in contact with confirmed cases, which um, I may not know because it has to be based on the outcome of your risk assessment, then suitable PPE in line with what they are likely to be exposed. In some cases where the admin person also helps move the patient, or you know, it's always very much like Janet says, specific to what does this person do in the set. Mm. And then there's a, a, a next question. Uh, are specific procedures to collect samples for testing in place? I guess is the question. Yes, there are specific SOPs, and those SOPs can be uh, found uh, on the NICD website. There's a toolkit that's available on their website for um, collecting samples and transporting samples. And associated forms to be completed yes. in order for the NICD to know exactly where the sample is coming from. Yes, yes, there's clear guidelines on that. Or they can form the NICD. The hotline, yes. You can both use the hotline and you can go to the website. Um, my sense is the Department of Health WhatsApp support service would also probably be useful to engage them. Well, for, for the group today, there is, uh, the NICD has a particular hotline just for the health workers. Yeah. So if you phone the hotline, you will be directed to a specific um, extension that deals with uh, healthcare workers. There's a similar extension for education and so on. So please do consider using that service as well. So the, the next question is from the Department of Health Regional Training Center, and that's Hotso asking, the Regional Training Center is receiving over 200 visitors a day who come from respective health facilities to attend in-service training. So what form of risk reduction measures can be applied by facilitators or trainers? I guess the very first thing to consider is less than 100 per group as announced by the state president on Sunday. What other measures would you recommend, T? I think we need to also look at essential trainings. You know, are these really essential trainings for now? Like if it's COVID-19 training, maybe it is essential trainings. But we need to do a risk analysis first to see, does this need to happen still? Mm. And then um, look at other ways of training, you know? Like we are exploring the Zoom platform. There are other ways that we can discuss Skype as well. Yes. Skype, look at even um, WhatsApp video conference. Yep, yeah, there are there are definitely there are different platforms that, that I think this time lends itself to us learning more about. Um, and then um, you know, just just limiting the numbers, increasing the space. Um, Okay, our next question is the key bottleneck from Dr. Salim um, for healthcare worker protection, especially private practitioners, is PPE availability. It's a big challenge. The rest of the hierarchy, although important, is not implementable in a GP practice. Is government focusing on this gap regarding correct PPE availability at no charge? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's correct. I mean, in terms of PPE availability, it's getting worse and worse every day. I think it's because most people who are not supposed to be using respirators or PPE, they are using PPE. Because and no now, risk assessment has been done. Exactly. No, because risk assessment is not done. Mm -hmm. People are scared and they start to use even PPE, even in a situation where they shouldn't be using PPE. But I'm not saying that if that was not the case, there will be sufficient supply. We know that everyone now is using uh, any form of PPE. So we need to do, to pay attention to our risk assessment and to make sure that we source PPE relevant to those who need them. Then in terms of uh, the other hierarchy, I mean, healthcare by its definition, there's no way that we can do away with PPE. PPE is the last result, yes, is the most um, element that is widely used in the healthcare setup. Hence, it's very important that whatever we use based on a risk assessment, we make sure that it's effective. Yeah. Not saying that we're undermining the top one, but PPE will always be used. 
I would also encourage Dr. Salim and other GPs to talk to your organizations and associations that you belong to. Uh, if you are an occupational medical practitioner, clearly that would be the South African Society of Occupational Medicine and rally around those sort of networks in order to ensure in conversation with authorities like the Department of Health to ensure that there's better mechanisms for the resources to be made available. And we know it's difficult under the current circumstances. I'm not sure if somebody wants to add something else for Dr. Steve. Another element is maybe they can also go to Sakima where they list a number of members. If they have one supplier loaded on their system, if they don't find some of the PPE, they can also look at alternative suppliers. Because I believe at this stage, you don't have to stick to your normal suppliers because mm -hmm. they may not have what you're looking for. Yeah. The next question is, what happens to the rest of the households when they have a contact in quarantine at home? So a healthcare worker is at home, social distancing is applicable, probably in agreement with the employer, and there are the family members. What recommendations do you have? It's very tricky, very tricky question. So where possible, they need to keep their distance. Yeah. Um, and um, if, if they can't, they're all going to be in quarantine. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if I need to bring that family member a plate of food or assist in one, would it be useful to, to have, basically on the sort of home risk assessment, um, to have some of the PP? I, I on, think on those the family are member sick, those sick, who are infected, they, they can push. They can put a surgical mask. Not necessary for me as a family member yes. bringing me. No, because okay. they, you are going to be protected from them. Yes. yes. The whole and you practice the basic the, the hygiene practices. Hygiene practices. Yes. You know, yes. Wash hands, cough properly. Mm -hmm. Well ventilated uh, spaces. Okay. Keeping in mind we're entering winter and we tend to close all these windows and so on, uh, we may have to bear a bit of cold during the next winter in order to ensure that ventilation is not completely shut down in our working environments and in our home environments. So the next question is um, a follow-up on the pick it up question uh, regarding disinfection of air. The environment is a room with medical waste in a clinic setting. Do we need medical surveillance for this? I would assume this is biological waste. Mm -hmm. It definitely Not need risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Monica. So a risk assessment is the first step, and that risk assessment will determine what are the hazards, what is the route of transmission, is COVID-19 a factor to consider besides the other biological hazards, and what would be the preventive measures based on the hierarchy of controls, as well as the slide that did share primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. And we need to look at whether or not it's covered, you know, it's closed, trying to, you know, um, just isolate it at the source. Impose a barrier. So people yes. who are yes. coming in that could infect. But if that's the source, try and make you know, some kind of a, uh, uh, So yeah. very solid, clear red plastic bags, which the medical waste is contained in, or shops containers, which shops are contained in, and these are properly sealed and cannot accidentally be opened, and anybody entering that room would not be exposed. And also not to stockpile medical waste, where possible, regular disposal. Yeah. yeah. So again, very basic occupation health and safety measures need to be in place as well for this. We need to rely on what we know and what has been usefully protecting us against biological hazards um, as we've carried along. So um, is that the last question? Um, my colleagues from the IT department has given us the, this is the end sign and Glenn has indicated and uh, um, so as to Barney, that that's the last question today. This has been a marathon session. It's been the longest session we've had as a video link for more than two hours and 15 minutes. And we want to thank all of you as participants. A reminder before you log off, if you've not yet shared your email address with us and want us to send you the Department of Health SOP and the DPSA document, please share your email address with us. It's also our means of ensuring we have an attendance register for our video link. At this point, I need to say many thanks to my colleagues here in front and from your right hand side, I think my left hand side, it's Dr. Odette Valming, 
from the occupational medicine section of the NOH. Um, it's uh, Jeanette Mangani, the head of our occupational hygiene section here at the NIH. Um, and next to her is Ms. Anika Matuka from the immunology and microbiology section. Thank you for your contributions, Anika, as well. And finally, not just the head of immunology and microbiology section here at the NIH, also the head of our um, COVID-19 outbreak response team, responsible for all of these outreach and information sessions reaching you in the different occupational groupings and settings in workplaces, is Dr. Tanusha Singh, our NIH Immunology and Microbiology Head. Ladies, thank you for your contributions. You. And gentlemen from the IT department, thank you for your contribution to a very successful video link. We bid you farewell and uh, we wish you well in setting up the systems, communications, flowcharts, SOPs, documents, and in deciding what needs to happen in your specific workplace, your specific institution. Goodbye from the NIH. Thank you.